uh, details. They applied the transformer network uh, on neural uh, machine translation. That was the, the, the big task that uh, they worked on. They also applied it on uh, constituency parsing. So for neural machine translation, they achieved state of the art at that point in time. And most of the implementation uh, details were kind of things that were done before. So the only big thing that they've uh, contributed uh, that made this so unique was more or less the multi-hit attention replacing all of the recurrence. And along with that comes with batching, with masking. We'll have a look at how this uh, batch and masking is applied. And the primary reason for having batch with masking uh, alongside with attention is because you want to do parallel um, computation, and that was the primary motivation for moving away from recurrence. Recurrence requires you to do HT minus 1, HT, HT plus 1. So you have to take one step at a time before you move on to the next step, right? So to do full parallel uh, computation, you can use attention and you can do batching, but uh, masking will have to come in for it to, to work properly. So we have a look at how that's done. And another thing uh, that they tried out was this positional encoding using uh, sine waves and cosine waves. Um, they claimed that uh, in their experiments, uh, it, made, it had similar results with learned represent, uh, position representations. And uh, we will have a look at uh, why the jury is still out on this. And the rest of the implementation tricks, uh, we put it, uh, I put it below. But we're not, we'll not be going into a lot of detail for the uh, stuff on the bottom of the slide. So, so the poll results, we... Okay, so we have around, okay, majority of people still think recurrence is uh, here to stay. So we have a look and see whether that's the case. These are some of the resources uh, online. A lot of the graphics, uh, visuals that they've done on Transformers are quite helpful. But I still feel that um, maybe at a high level, it's still quite kind of hard to see what the Transformer is doing. A lot of it explains the details, uh, how, how the, the different components in the transformer work. So maybe we'll have a discussion as to what exactly this uh, architecture is trying to achieve. And first of all, we see that um, this is still an encoder-decoder network. We have on the left side the encoder, and we have the right side the decoder. And why, why, why do you think... Um, we are still using an encoder decoder for a transformer. What's the what's the point of having an encoder and a decoder? Yeah. Okay. So so what what does the, what does an encoder do? What what do you think is its primary uh, objective? What why what are we trying to do when we when we have an encoder? Understand, sorry? Understand. Uh, NLU, anything you, you were going to say? Most encoders are just trying to reduce the uh, dimensionality and go from a high entropy signal. Yeah. To, sorry, a low entropy signal to a high entropy signal. Okay, so lower, lowering dimensionality, trying to uh, and capture more information in, in a shorter uh, amount of uh, uh, shorter length representation, let's say, for example. Okay, so what do you think is a good representation or a good encoding for, uh, let's say, a sequence to sequence, let's say neural machine translation? What is a good encoding? What would be a good encoding in your view? Because we want to see whether or not an encoder from the recurrence model versus an encoder from the full attention model, I mean, how, how do they compare, right? So, so on, 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 let's say on, the, on your understanding of uh, machine uh, translation, your understanding of translation uh, between languages, what would be a good uh, encode, encode, encoding? So if you have, a, let's say translation, you have a source uh, sequence, right, source sentence, what would be a good encoding? Identify dependencies. Um, what kind of dependencies? 
long distance dependencies for neural machine translation, do you really need that? Okay, so, so don't have to answer this question now. Just have that question uh, at, at, at the back of your mind because we're going to go through the encoder step by step and try and figure out what is it trying to do, and whether or not ultimately what, what comes out of the encoder, uh, does, it, does, it, does it give us a good encoding, a good representation at that point in time, all right? So, and for the decoder, what do you think the decoder is trying to do? What, what, what do you think the decoder is trying to do uh, in your NMT? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's translating, but what are, we, what, are we, what are we doing? We take what? Okay, so the encoder takes, takes in the source uh, sentence, right? Takes in a source uh, sequence, and it tries to encode that into some representation, right? Okay, so there are a few uh, things that we discussed. Maybe we're trying to reduce the dimensionality down to a, a smaller representation. Uh, and for the decoder, what, what is the decoder trying to do? What does it take in? Okay. All right. So it has to be conditioned on something that it's given to it, right? So we obviously think that w the source sentence itself is not good enough for it to be conditioned on the source sentence itself as as whatever input that you've provided uh, is not good enough. So we th we think of the encoder as trying to create a better representation of the source sentence, right? So the decoder is then conditioned on this output of the encoder to try and do a generative uh, decoding, right? So those are the rough ideas that we have. Anyone ever wondered why this is called a transformer network? No, everyone ever wondered, wondered why? No, ever wondered why? Does anyone know why it's called a transformer network? You wanna guess? Yeah. Because it takes one uh, representation, Okay, so if, if we take that idea, right, that the transformer <laughs> network is trying to take something that you provide as input and do transformations on it such that it becomes a useful encoding, right? And then we take that and we try and do similar like transformations. Uh, on the encoder side to do the generative exercise. So, okay, so all these things just bear that in mind and we'll go through step by step. So the first thing that we want to talk about is what, what is being fed into the transformer network, right? So at the very bottom, we see input embeddings. That's quite standard. Everyone understands uh, why we need uh, input embeddings, right? So we just have an embedding matrix. We just project all your input tokens into the uh, embedding matrix and we get your embeddings. So what is uh, interesting here is that uh, you see on the right in the red box we have positional encoding being added to your input embeddings all right and you see the uh, graphic on the bottom low so your embeddings these are your individual word embeddings for each word in the input sequence and the dimensionality of the uh, word embeddings what you do is you see that the positional encoding uh, vectors themselves are being added to your word embedding directly. And the way you generate these positional encodings is you use a sine and a cosine uh, function to generate the numbers or the values within the positional encoding vectors depending on the position in the sequence. So your POS, that's your position. Your position in the sequence, so if it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that will be your POS. And each positional encoder would have a different value for its dimensions depending on where it is in the position. Anyone wants to Hazard a guess why this captures position? Or why is this a good idea? Oh, okay, so there's both, right? You see the, the top uh, formula is uh, sine, 
the second one is cosine. So what, what is done is the sine and cosine uh, values are concatenated together. So this is the uh, plot that you see on the top left. So on the left, there is half of it is on the green, the green shaded side, right? That's the sine function. And on the right side, the one with yellow, that's your cosine function values. So the sine and cosine values are concatenated together for every single positional <coughs> encoding vector. So their values would vary depending on their POS. Is this intuitive to any of you? All right, so the, the, the hypothesis was that if you use sine and cosine, then it should be able to extend to sequences longer than what you see in training. So your sequences that you put into your training would come from uh, varying, varying lengths. Let's say you have varying sentences in, in, in German or English. They have varying lengths. And there, but there will be a max length of, let's say, 20, 30 words. So the idea is that if you want to have positional encodings, you can either do it uh, via a fixed representation. That's your alternative, right? Fixed meaning that for position one, I'm going to uh, change the values by how much. Position two, change the values by how much. Position three, change the values by how much. So if I reach um, length 30, uh, it, it, it won't do very well, I, I, I believe, for uh, longer sequences, let's say during inference time. Inference time. Right, so, but if you do a sine and cosine, then you know, it's just uh, repeating itself eventually. Right? So you will be able to hopefully extrapolate from a uh, sequence length of 20 to 30 within your training to maybe slightly longer than that when you see it in print. That was the hypothesis at, uh, at least. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I guess the idea is this is kind of like a hash. You you are trying to say that for uh, sequences, generally there there could be some repeated repetition in in, in in the occurrences. Whatever, but uh, what you're trying to do is allow for the positional encodings to cap capture some of these um, repetitions, right? So, anyone sees a problem with this? Do you think it works? Do you think it's a good idea? Like, is this good? You're going to try this? Why, why do you think we need positional encodings uh, at, at all in the first place? I mean, we didn't have this in, in, in RNNs, right, in recurrence. So why why are we using positional encoding? All right. So what we're what we're saying is that because there's no more recurrence, we are not capturing sequence anymore. So we need some kind of positional encoding to capture that sequence. All right, so that that's the that's the hypothesis, and this is that's what they've done. So we'll see how well this works. Any questions so far about this? But then, how do we how how do the how do the sine and cosine functions capture? Uh, because because words presumably don't occur uh, at at the same frequency, right? So how how do we capture different frequencies? How does this do, do that? Anyone read, read the, the paper already? All right, so the idea is that if you look at the colorful plot with the uh, sine waves, each wave is uh, of a different uh, range, right? Because what we have is we want to see whether we can capture different frequencies.
percent encoding will be very, 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 very narrow. It will be like uh, zero and one, 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 and then as you go along, uh, you you have longer and longer frequency, uh, so that you have varying wavelengths that hopefully capture different types of uh, frequencies within your text. So that was the the idea. I do have one question that I don't have the answer uh, for, though, which is that these sine and cosine uh, functions are actually within the positional encoding vector itself. So if you see on the top left, right, this, this, this plot, right, the x-axis is actually your dimension of your positional encoding, your positional vector, the x-axis, right? And the y-axis is your position. So you see that your, your uh, positional encoding actually captures all the different uh, sine waves and cosine waves at different uh, points, right? So I haven't really figured out how, how does this actually help you to extend uh, to longer sequences. And uh, some papers that later did uh, so constituency passing, for example, they, they found that actually this didn't help. Uh, they got worse results using uh, the sinusoidal positional encoding. So uh, if you're going to experiment with this, uh, let us know whether uh, this is something that actually helps your, your, your level. Okay, so you see that from the bottom, right, the input, these are your words, right? So each word, you have an embedding dimension because you project every word through an uh, embedding matrix, right? The word embeddings. So let's say this is a 4D uh, toy example. This is a 4D word, word embedding, right? You actually add the positional vector for that position to that word if it's at that position. So assuming that if this word first word occurs somewhere else, it will have a different positional encoding added to it. Right. Yeah? So, so you were talking about how the, the, the P model varies, right? Yes, that's right. Is that all in the same model? It's all in the same, same uh, vector, actually. Okay, so, so you, you add Your, okay, so first of all, your, your positional encoding vector must be of the same length as your word embedding for them to be able to sum properly. Okay. Right? They must be of the same dimensionality. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, it's not very obvious how this is actually supposed to, like... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, I'll just move. So we'll go to the, this, this is not really the meaty part. The, uh, this is the meaty part, the multi-head attention. Right, so I'm just going to do a recap so that uh, we have a sense of how to map what we've learned from sequence to sequence to uh, the current uh, multi-head attention transformer. So... You guys look a little bit perplexed looking at all your faces. So I just want to make sure you guys are on the ball. Are you guys okay? This is really a discussion. Okay, so there's a question from I think Lewis, right? Uh, that's uh, it's not clear whether it's encoding the position. Are you guys, are you guys clear about why why the the function uh, the length function by helping to encode position? No. Okay. There's at least a couple people who say no. Uh, anyone who has an inkling, you guys want to guess? No. 
Okay, so in the Slack channel, please uh, let's put the attention paper, uh, the it primary attention yeah. paper, somebody can do that. And uh, while you guys are listening to the explanation again, maybe we can um, go through the paper as well as a group. Okay, to, uh, just to try and see whether we, 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 we get a sense of what's going on. On the top left, that plot, right? You think of it as every row being a positional encod encoding. It's a vector. Each row, right, from left to right, along the x-axis. So on the top left, that, that square, right? Every row is a positional encoding vector. So on the y-axis, these are the different positions. So at position 0, you see right at the top, it is just 1s and zeros. Right, it's just 1s and zeros. Oh, sorry, here. So here, it will be just 1s and zeros. Right? So this is the first position's positional encoding. But as you go down the positions, you will see that the positional encoding will start to change. Right? You start to vary as you go down the positions. But eventually, it should get back to okay, this is the dimensionality of a positional encoding, which is this. So this one, you see, this 0, 0, 1, 1, right? This is actually position 1. The top position, zeros all the way and then 1s. But of course, this is just a 4D dimension, right? Whereas this is a full D model 512 dimension vector, right? Because that's what they use, the dimensionality that they use in, the, in their model. So this is one positional encoding. So if the first word appears in your sequence, it has an embedding value of the D dimension, it gets summed with all these, these ones and these zeros. Then your second word gets summed with the second positional vector. The third word, fourth word, all the way down to whatever number. And the idea is that because this is, these are sine cosine waves, they, they, they repeat after a certain number of positions, right? And each dimension of that positional encoding captures a different frequency of the, of the wave. So we can hopefully capture different frequencies because we don't really know how frequent um, the words may appear again, right? They are useful. Which, which frequencies are most useful for, for uh, this particular translation task or, or sequence to sequence task? So each dimension is capturing a different frequency. But each row here, this is in itself a position vector. So from top to down, we are moving by position. Uh, yeah, 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 you're right. But I guess um, concatenating ha brings its own problems as well because this is a very, this is a multi layer uh, network. So you, you'll also see later eventually that when we, we go down the layers, we have problems with uh, increasing dimensionality if we concatenate too much. Yeah. But the adding part is also something that you, you, you need to bear in mind as to uh, what are we trying to do with the encoder at the end. So, this was the earlier question that I asked. So what kind of encoding comes out at the top? Yeah, but I think I really need to move on to the uh, important start. Otherwise, I don't think we'll, we'll be able to finish. And then we have another CNN thing coming up. So uh, have a great discussion later on. Uh, and I'll, I'll be part of it. Yeah, so the sequence to sequence with attention, what we did in the sequence to sequence uh, in the recurrence model was that you have your uh, hidden states from the encoder. OK, so this is just a recap. Hidden states from the encoder. These are your red encodings, the vectors, right? So these are your hidden state vectors. So if these are your hidden state vectors, what is this, this green one? Sorry? Who did the weak? Um... <laughs> this is the decoder, right? Decoders what? Hidden state, right? So the hidden state at, at, at S1, uh, let's say, all right? So this is the hidden state, the first hidden state. So what we do with the first hidden state is we do 
either a dot or a, a additive, right? A project through a, a weight matrix, either that or directly dot, dot with your hidden states. And what we get is we get attention scores, right? Because this will now have a dot product with every single hidden state and it will give us a score. So once we have a score, we can get a soft max out of it. And from this soft max, what do we do? This is the formula, right? So the ST, this is your hidden state time T. So at the decoder side, we have a hidden state being generated at time step T. We do this projection uh, either through a matrix or dot product with all the hidden states. And so we get this E vector, right? Attention scores. So attention scores, this E vector goes through a softmax, we get a distribution which we use as weights to do what? It gets dotted back with the, as a weighted sum of the, H is what? Hidden states, right? So we go back here, this attention distribution, this is then, a weight, produces a weighted sum vector. And so this then becomes your attention vector, which has dimensionality of H, your hidden states, right? So your, your, your attention output. So what we are trying to do here is that from the encoder side, what do we keep track? What do we store? For attention, uh, sequence to sequence to work. What do we need to store on the encoder side? All the hidden states, right? We need to store all the hidden states. And every time we have on the decoder side, a new hidden state, we use that new hidden state to do what? To get a new, a new attention output, right? How do we do that? So every time there's a new one, this new one, new hidden state on the decoder side, gets dot products with all the hidden states, gives us a new attention distribution, and we get the weighted sum with the hidden states, weighted sum of all the hidden states, and we get a new attention output, right? So in a way, right, what we are doing here is that on the, in the parlance of keys, queries, and values, what are, which are your keys? Do you understand key, keys, queries, and values? When, when do we see them? When do we use them? Like when do you see key values, queries, and stuff like that? When do you come across them? Keys, values. Come yeah? on, guys. Yeah? Mapping, right? Some mapping. Hashing, mapping. Dictionaries, right? So we, we, we have keys and values. So the keys are, are, are what? what? What are the keys? What are we looking at? So as a hash, right, you, 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 have, you, have, you need to have keys for you to look up what? Values, right? Yeah? Okay, so here, right, which, which ones are your keys, which ones are your queries? And which one are your values? Because we need, we need to be clear about this before we go to transformer. Once we go to transformer, right, it's going to be very confusing if you don't uh, think, think clearly in terms of what, what the keys, queries, and values are trying to do. Right, so your keys are, which one? This hidden states? Or these hidden states? Decoder or encoder hidden states? Decoder hidden states, these are keys. So which are your queries? Attention scores? So your keys and your queries give you the values. Close but not quite. Um, okay, think of it, let's say in the Python dictionary, right? So if you code in Python, you use a dictionary. Your dictionary will have keys, and each key will have a value, right? So the keys and the values, they are always, they are stored there, right? They are stored like, they're like, a, they're like a database. So they are, they, are, they are always there. 
right? The keys, the keys at least are always there. But they have a corresponding value, but the keys are always there. You don't you don't come up with a new key at every time. That's your database. Your dictionary is your database. So your keys must be existing. Right? So your keys are existing. So these hidden states on your on your encoder side, they are your keys. So which one is your query now? Yes, the green one. This is your query. Because at every single time you come up with a new hidden state on the decoder side, you have a new query. And from this query, to get the right key, I'm actually doing a dot product with the keys. And these will give me some distribution, some distribution for me to then get my value. But how do I get my value? It's the weighted sum of what? Weighted sum of what? Yes, encoded hidden states. Right, so your encoded hidden states, right, are your values in this case as well. Because what you are doing is you have keys, you have a new query at each time, and what happens is your query picks out this distribution, which then is used to generate your value, which is this. But how is it generated? It's generated with back with your encoded hidden states. This is the this is this is just here, right? You use the dot product back with your encoded hidden states. So this is your V. Alright? Very clear? Which one is your Q, key, K, and V? K. Very good. So now let's get to the Okay. All right. So, multi head attention. Let's see. That's right, it's weighted sums of these. So these are also your values in this case. All right? These are also your values. It's just that you 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 can have different values, for example. So then your so the, the transformer they actually have different values. So you have keys, queries, and values being different things. Right? So then you have still have the same thing, which is your query will dot your 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 keys, but then rather than weighted sum of your uh, memory, so called. Instead of doing that, we project it uh, with uh, a, a new set of weights. So those values are different in that case. But I'm just drawing uh, this parallel so that you can see how that is different later on. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, focus here on this part, right? So what we've done so far is just really the first step. We get the uh, word embeddings, we add the positional. Encodings, and we see this split into three, right? So in your transformer uh, architecture diagram, you see you have your split into three. So what this does is that it comes in here like this, your V, your K, and your Q, all right? So what's your V and K and your Q here? 
What's coming in from here? But what are they? So, because when we look at the sequence to sequence, <coughs> right, your keys is decoder side. Oh, sorry, your keys are your encoder side. Your query decoder side, and your values are here. So we know what what uh, corresponds to what, right? But here, your v, q, k, and q come from where? They all come from. They all come from the input. They are your input, right? So your input is a sequence of vectors which have now been augmented with their position. Okay? So this is your, this is just your sequence. So your sequence comes in here, your sequence gets, goes through what? It goes through a linear projection. So here for V, for K and Q, right, the inputs are all your sequences, right? They go through a weight matrix. So you have a V, a W, V, W, K, and W, Q, which is this linear projection here. All of them go through a similar projection but different weights. So what are we trying to do here? Whenever we do this sort of linear projection through a weight matrix, what are we doing? What are we interested in? Uh, oh yes, yes, it, 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 it can change the dimension depending on the size of your matrix, but, but what are we trying to do whenever we do a linear projection? In, in, in the deep learning realm of things, what's our goal? Remember this is a transformer network, right? We are doing transformations. So, right, so we're taking we're taking inputs, we're doing transformations on these inputs. So what kind of so we just what kind of transformation is this when we do a linear projection? Just a, a dot, yeah? Uh, okay, so yeah, one, one way to think about this is we are trying to project them into uh, another space, right? Project them into another space so that we can represent it in a different different way. It's a, it's a linear transformation. There's a linear uh, uh, relationship, but it's a different space, right? So for each for each of these vectors going in, you have a sequence, right? So let's say the sequence is 10, 10, 10 uh, vectors, 10 words. So 10 words, you have 10 of these words all going through the same projections. They all get transformed into the same common space, but it's a different space from what they were originally in. So now you have, tr you have three different representations of your inputs once you go through a, this, this, and this. So get the idea? Right, so what we are trying to do is we want them to be represented three different ways. But they are all actually coming from your inputs. So now your sentence has three different representations. And these are how they are then combined here. This scale dot product, this is, this is how you blow this up, right? After they get projected. So you have one representation of your inputs, another representation of inputs here. What do they go through? They go through a query and key, exactly the same dot product attention that you've seen in the sequence to sequence. This is no different from that, right? This is exactly what's, what happened in your sequence to sequence. So what you're doing now is that you have two representations of the inputs going through attention, so that now you have, you have what? You have some kind of attention score, right? Right, you have some kind of attention score. After you go through the sort max, it is an attention score. Attention score of what? Between what? Previously, you had attention score between your decoder query and your encoder hidden states. So that's your attention score. It means well, and now I have this query, what key do I attend to, right? As Prof said, you are trying to figure out which key to attend to. So now, both our keys and our queries come from the inputs, the same sequence. So what is it trying to tell you here? What is attending to what? You are trying to learn the, the, the attention distribution, attention score of what paying attention to what.
Yes, Q and K, but K, but what 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 is what is Q and what is K? Where do they come from? The inputs, right? Your same sequence. <coughs> yes. Yes, but of course you've gone through a, a, a tra different transformation each one, so each one is a different representation. But they all came from they are all direct transformations from the same inputs. So what is this? This is essentially doing what? If all of them come from the same same origin, right? We are doing attention score between what? Between themselves, right? So what is this called? This we just call self attention, right? So previously, what we did was the sequence to sequence attention was between encoder between uh, encoder and decoder. So your attention is calculated by saying now at this step in my decoder, what part of the encoder hidden states do I want to attend to? Which source words hidden state? do I want to attend to? But here, what we are doing is, because all of them come from the same sequence, what we are really saying is, we're interested to figure out attention score within itself. So from word to word, right? Self-attention, self-attention within its, its own sequence, right? Okay? But what we are doing is, we are giving it a little bit more expression than uh, the encoder decoder of the sequence to sequence because we, we also project your V and we project Q and K all in, into into their own representation, so there's more expressive power now. Um, we, we we can learn uh, different, learn good representations for your inputs. As a as a query, meaning as as the thing that I want to uh, seek attention from uh, to towards, and as the attendee, meaning the one that's being attended to, right? So you have different representations for your inputs. All represented by the weights here. Okay, we, we, we are not we don't we don't we, we don't detect what uh, what sort of attention uh, it it is meant to learn. Yes, yes, and 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 this this goes this goes to the question why why do we why do we want to do this? Why why is self attention necessary at all? We didn't have this in your sequence to sequence, right? So what is this trying to achieve? Self attention. Okay, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out because, of course, uh, this then goes into the the, the what, would, what 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 comes out of this and goes in the next level. So what we do here is just be clear. All from the same inputs, you get attention score to calculate self attention, and then you then pro, you then do a uh, you get a you get a value calculated uh, value vector uh, or attention. Output vector, like like your sequence to sequence one here, except that there's a difference now, in that here, what's the dimensionality of this? This this is obviously not not uh, I mean this is a fixed length vector, right? This is a fixed length vector, depending on the dimensionality of uh, this this is h uh, the hidden the hidden state yeah correct the dimensionality of the hidden state but here right this also determines what is the dimensionality of your vector coming out here right so what the uh, transformer network uh, the authors of that paper have done is that they've ensured that all these Dimensions are the same, and the reason for that is once you come up here, right? This, you see this add and norm square here, is being summed again. So there's this residual connection coming up here again. So at each sub layer, right, there is a connection that takes your input and sums it with the output of every sub layer. So for that summing to work, you need to make sure that your dimensions are 
always equal going in and out, right? So this weight matrix will have to be of the dimension where ultimately when I do this V uh, with this attention score, when we do the matrix multiplication, this must give me the same dimensionality as what went in here because this gets added here. Okay, so that's just one of the implementation things that you need to bear in mind. Dimensionality is the same. Okay, so now we come to the uh, interesting part. I mean, that, that is just attention. It's nothing, nothing very interesting about that. But what we have here is we have the multi-head attention. Right, so the multi-head attention means that what? Rather than just having one projection and one attention score and then one value calculation and one attention vector coming out, we have what? We calculate how many H number of attentions. So this is where your multi-head attention comes in, right? We actually have multiple heads. So for every head, it does the same thing. So it's just repeated. Yeah? Head is just another attention. So instead of calculating just one attention, you calculate many attentions. That's all, it's just, it's just multiples. So to calculate different attentions, you need to have different weights for these as well, right? You need to have different weights so that they can then learn their own rep, uh, representations of what that attention head should be paying attention to. Still, still the same, yes. But they all have different weights for the different heads. They have to be because then you will be learning new attention representations, right? But they're all still self-attention. But right now, what we're doing is we are instead of just doing it once, like your sequence to sequence uh, encoder decoder, we're we're doing it h times, all in parallel, yeah. I guess initialization weights. Yeah, that's that's this it's, it's really that simple. In terms of actually coding this, uh, I mean the concept of it is actually not that difficult. But uh, uh, based on the paper, yes, we'll, we'll show you some some uh, results. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's exactly right. You're you're trying to do the random initial power um, from each of the going in a way. All right, so everyone so far okay with this? Because this is actually the most uh, challenging part. Ah, okay, why do we do self-attention? Yes, I mean, we didn't really answer that, but yeah, but why? We didn't do this for recurrent neural networks. So what, what makes this necessary now? Okay. All right. Okay. That, 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 that's, that's a good answer. Uh, the thing is this. You think about the alternative. The alternative is without self-attention, right? So without self-attention, what will happen? Without self-attention, your inputs will go in, right? Where would they go now? It will just go into a feed forward network. Let's say, let's say you don't have this at all, right? No, no, no self attention. Goes to the feed forward network. What, what kind of encoding are you doing there? What do you think makes a uh, recurrent neural network at LSTM right work so well as an encoder in the in the in, in, in the previous realm, right? What what makes this a good encoder? It is a pretty good encoder, but what makes it a good encoder here? So every time, right, there is some, there is some uh, hidden state representation that is uh, being calculated based on past T steps, right? So because of that, we are encoding some, some form of uh, order, some form of sequence, and we are also encoding the history of this sequence, right, up to that point. But if you don't have recurrence, what kind of, encoded, what kind of encoding will, you, will come out from here without this? You just go to the feed for one I mean, what are your options? 
I mean, obviously, you need to come up with some other form of uh, architecture to say you're encoding something properly, right? And if this is a sequence, what other form? I mean, you can come up with other ideas, but what, what, what else do you have? From an encoding point of view, if we don't have recurrence and we don't have self-attention, so like what like uh, what was said, you 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 let self-attention tell you which part of the sequence is important at this stage when you're doing the encoding, right? Okay, so if you go back to the recurrent neural network, right? The recurrent neural network, just like how Kang said, has this very important right-facing arrow going between states, right? So there, we're basically saying explicitly, attention is only focused on the last state, making that Markovian assumption that only the last state was important. And somehow, when we do this type of encoding, we are encoding past states prior to that in the Markovian encoding at the last state, right? So if you wanted to get information at t minus two, t minus three, that all has to come into t minus one for it to be Right? So with self-attention, we get rid of those arrows, right? Because we no longer are doing recurrence, right? So those arrows don't appear in the, the, the network architecture for the transformer anymore, right? So otherwise, it'll just go straight up, right? We won't have those sideways arrows. So we need to introduce sideways arrows, but in a smart way, right? We want to train which of those arrows are supposed to be there. Maybe for some words, some hidden states, it will be the last state, t minus one. For some other words, it could be equally t minus two and t minus three. So we would have an arc skipping t minus one and just coming to t minus two, t minus three. Meaning that two positions back, those words were the things that I needed to know in order to predict what I'm going to do now. Okay? So you can think of that as what the self-attention is doing. It's basically trying to draw which arrows from the past states are important now for this state, right? In the recurrent neural network, we just said, forget it, that was too complicated. I'm just going to use the last state. I'm going to make the Markovian assumption and just say the last state was important, right? So now what we're saying is, let's go model that. Let's undo that architectural design that says only the last state is important. I'm going to learn which was the state that was important to come up with the output at this point in time. Okay, that's what the self-attention is for. So the sine and cosine, I think, is uh, from a previous part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's already it's already in the in the um, word vectors already, right? So they are already added in here. So they already encode that information in it. Yeah. So there will be that information. And if you have the same word appearing in different places, they will have slightly different values because of that position encoding. Yeah. So this is uh, what uh, to answer your question. Do 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 they do they do the multi heads uh, actually diverge? Uh, learn learn different things. Uh, this is what they uh, perhaps cherry pick usually uh, from the network to figure out uh, which. Uh, attention hits are what they're learning, so obviously they um, they didn't show all the attention hits, but they managed to find some that seem to make sense. And these are the same sequences, but different attention hits. And you see that they are learning uh, different weights. So they activate at uh, different connections. Yeah. So the idea seems to be that multi-hit attention uh, does add some kind of uh, uh, value for self-attention, so that you you're not just constrained with a, a straight, straight alignment kind of attention where if I have this word, I can only pay attention to uh, this other word. But if you have multi-head attention, what you can do is I can learn different ways of paying attention. If I have this word, I can pay attention in this way to this word or I can pay attention to another way, another word in another way, right? So how do you want to combine that uh, is, is, is uh, up, up to the network to learn. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's worked for uh, constituency passing. It's worked very well for it. Yeah, state of the art uh, comes from uh, transformer network. Okay, so 
the rest of this is not very uh, controversial, so this is quite straightforward. Um, but what, what, what we need to focus on here is that why do we have a residual connection here? Why do we have a residual connection here? Why do we have a residual connection here? Okay, the idea is that our inputs go in, right? <coughs> when, when they are, when they are uh, transformed during the multi-head attention, right? What, what is being done is that each vector, let's say if it's, uh, we use the paper's dimensionality, right? 512, 512 dimension vectors, right? So this is 512, 512, and 512, right? To get each different attention, attention vectors, right? What would, what, what would the dimensionality be if you concatenate all of them? Assuming that each one is the same dimension here. So how do you get, ultimately, if you concatenate? If these are all the same dimensions, 5 on 2, 5 on 2, 5 on 2, going through projection, also 5 on 2, and then later, for each attention, it's also 5 on 2. So what will come out here, concatenate? What will your dimensionality be? H times 5, 1, 2. Okay, so if, if each of them goes through the same thing, and they're all 5, 1, 2, right? What comes out here is H times 5, 1, 2. The problem with H times 5, 1, 2 here is that you can't do this, this, this part, right? The adding. Because what was here previously, the input, each dimension was, each word vector's dimension was 512. So this means that to do this multi-head attention, you actually, what, they, what they did was they actually split the 512 dimension uh, representation here into H. H different shorter vectors. So in this case, H was 8. They used 8 in the paper. So each vector that comes out from here is actually 64. All right? So 64 dimension vectors, 8 of them. So 8 64 dimension vectors for every 512 that goes in here. So what happens is you then concatenate them. So this kind of like splits them up into 8. And then once you get the attention, Done. So you have eight multi-head attentions. Once you get all the attention uh, outputs, you then concatenate them back. It becomes five one two again. So in a way, you can think of the input being split split up, go through set goes goes through self attention in a smaller subspace, but then concatenate back to form your reform your original representation of the inputs. So if you think of it this way, right? Th this is this is kind of like maybe why they call it a transform because whatever comes in here comes out in the same shape, ultimately. And, and the way that it is done is that this is split and rejoined back, split and rejoined back in parallel, and so that they kind of represent what went in, but in a different representation. So being transformed in through the self-attention and through the feed-forward. Yeah? You can think of it a little bit like a meat grinder. You know, you just put in, and then it gets chopped up mixed up and then reformed yeah. into a chicken nugget. Yeah. You know, that's fried and then served. Yeah. I, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think that's, that's how you can see it. Because then this is why your, your residual connection is important. Because what it's doing is, this, this adding, right, comes from the, the beginning, the input. So in a way, what you're doing here is really just adding back to your original inputs, right? And again, from here, you're just adding it back. So in a way, you can think of this as augmenting your inputs. Right, you're, you're, you're adding information to your inputs. Your inputs comes up here, right? It gets as, add, added back. And after it goes through, even the feedback, it gets added back again, right? So all these things tells us that what you're really doing is you're trying to learn a lot of information from the sequence and putting them back into the sequence in some way. Yeah? And that gives you your encoding. But this also means that you must do layer norm because if you keep adding, what happens? What happens when you keep adding vectors? They become very large, right? So we need to do layer norm. That's, that's, that's the rationale behind, behind this at every single time you add it back because otherwise you start exploding uh, your values that explode. Plus uh, your dot product as well, which is why you have a scale 
um, value here. Otherwise, when you do direct vector to vector dot products, eventually, and with so many heads, uh, eventually you'll get very large values as well. Okay, so that's that's the reason for this. Uh, this one position wise feed forward network. So um, you then go through a feed forward network. What I originally put here was why do we need a feed forward network when we already have attention? Because for your sequence to sequence uh, encoder decoder, we just took the attention score, we got an attention uh, output vector, and we just concatenated that uh, with your, your hidden state and we, we generated an output from there, right? So why, why can't we just use the output from here? So here we already have all the self attention vectors, right? All concatenated together, we, 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 we've learned the self attention weights to say, okay, which, which parts of the sequence should pay attention to itself in what way? Why can't we just take that and use it um, as our, encode, and our encoding? Why do we have to go through this field network? And why is this uh, called position wise? In the interest of time, um, I will just, I'll just uh, try and answer the, the first one. The rest of it, I'll, I'll leave it for uh, your contemplation. Yeah, for further discussion. But um, the first one really is when we have self-attention, we, we, uh, we have some representation saying that, okay, so this is how this word should pay attention to that, this word should pay attention to that. But um, how, how, do we, how do we combine all of that? Let them interact um, in different ways. So I guess that's, that's kind of the reason why we have some sort of feed forward network where we allow for more interactions um, between uh, the different uh, inputs. Yeah. So if we have attention that's between this and that, this and that, but we want to allow for uh, more complex interactions between them, then we have another few layers that allows us to do some nonlinear uh, transformation for between these uh, attention uh, vectors. Yeah. So how is this position wise? And and this one, this is very interesting. Um, how, why, why is the feedforward uh, network two layer with one value between uh, the same as two convolutions with one kernel size one? So I'll leave that for your uh, thoughts. We can post it on Slack later as well. But uh, Okay, so now we go to the decoder very quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, on the decoder side, what, what makes this different from the encoder side is just the masking. Otherwise, it is actually the same. This is also self-attention. So self-attention, similar to the encoder side, but with masking. And the reason why we are masking is because of what? Because here, right, if you have inputs coming in, right, V, K, and Q, all coming in together, this is what? This is the entire what? This is the entire what? It's the entire sequence, right? K is also the entire sequence. Q is also the entire sequence. So when we generate this attention for the entire sequence, you have this, this sort of thing, right? It's the entire sequence. You calculate attention scores, attention weights for the entire sequence, all the words. So if there are like n words, it'll be n square uh, connections, right? But what, what, why, why, why is this a problem when we do the decoding? Not noise. Okay, so this is encoding. So you see, they all pay attention to, it, to, to, to one another, right? They all pay attention to one another. So the decoding side, this is the first token. So it takes its attention from itself. That's all. The second token gets its attention from the previously generated one. And the third one gets its attention from the previous two generated one. But because of the architecture, the way that the... The way this is done, right, the way attention is done here, right, is that there's no sequence, there's no recurrence, right? There's no, I do one first, then do the next one. I do one first, then do the next one. Attention is calculated for the entire sequence in parallel. So because of that, you will generate scores for the entire sequence coming in here. During training time, what we put in here is we put in the sequence shifted right. So the sequence shifted right, the, the, the target sequence shifted right, 
It's the entire sequence. It's the entire sentence. So if this is an English sentence, right? It's the entire sentence, but shift right once. Shift right once for training. So it will calculate attention for all the words together in the same way that it's doing for the encoder side. But what we do is we need to mask out the scores for the ones on the right. Okay, so we need to mask out the scores on the one on the right so that they don't, the scores for those attention calculations don't get passed on to the next layer here. That's the whole point of having the mask so that we can do parallel calculations the same way as the encoder side, but disregard. So your, your, your uh, mask for the decoder side would be uh, sort of like a diagonal. Uh, a lower triangle diagonal with, with uh, true or ones, and then the upper, upper diagonal would be uh, zeros. So we mask out the upper triangle, upper triangular of the, of the, of the attention scores. Yeah? Do you guys all get that much? Oh, I'm actually quite a bit wrong. But so I noticed that on the other side, Okay, so the decoder side for training, we put in the entire sequence because we put the masking, the masking, right? So, so it will still calculate. It will still calculate the attention scores based on the entire sequence. It will still do that. It's just that before it gets passed to the next layer, we mask out the ones that you are not supposed to look at, so that it doesn't influence the next level. It's it's just that it's done out of convenience, right? Out of parallelization, out of batching, right? We just do it based on the entire sequence. That entire sequence, when, during training, gets fed in one shot, and that, that's what makes it fast, right? It's just that after we calculate it. We ignore it. We wipe it out. We wipe out the the ones that are not supposed to be looked at before we calculate the next attention. Yeah, I mean that's the whole point of having a separate decoder. The separate decoder is supposed to learn. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. So this is the self-attention part. Look, ignoring anything that is the future, but taking into account being conditioned on the prior of the decoder, the output sequence. It is only when we come to the next layer where this then looks at the entire part of the encoded sequence. So this is where your attention from the encoder side comes in now, and there's no masking here because it has access to the entire encoder attention. It has access to everything here. But it is only when it's self-attention that you only look at the priors of the outputs, output sequence. And this is for training. For inference, there's no batching in, in, in this way. For inference, you have to do the decoder one by one token by token, because it has to be conditioned on the previous generated token, so it loses the ability to be parallel uh, at the generation phase when it's inference, but for training, you can do it by batch, just make sure that you mask out the future parts of the sentence so that it doesn't affect the attention scores coming up. Yes, sir? The next word to predict, just like any of your translation or language modeling. So this is a softmax over the vocab size of your target target language. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll I'll not go through in detail. I'll just let you guys have a look at all this so that we can uh, continue with the next uh, part, next segment. But these are some. This is state of the art. This is a constituency passing using a transformer uh, encoder. So. Different papers have used um, either the encoder or either the decoder or some combination, uh, but idea is multi-head attention. And this is um, this is in speech 
recognition, uh, this fluency detection used to like get rid of uh, words that are kind of like filler or like you know, it's like uh, I I um yeah uh, I I didn't you know, so with repeat just uh, removing this sort of uh, error so called from speech so that you can get a proper sentence. Also, uh, state of the art, and this one is a language model. This open AI, but uh, it hasn't been submitted for peer review yet. I mean, so far this is just like a teaser. I uh, have still waiting for this to come up. So, um, idea is that they learn a language model uh, using the transformer decoder side, and then use this to transfer learn for different types of classification tasks or uh, QA tasks uh, after pre-training based on a language model. Yeah. So OpenAI also uses a transformer. They have the code uh, uh, on, online, I think. And this one, some of the comments here have uh, comparisons between your RNNs and transformers. You can have a look at these papers uh, later on. It's quite interesting. And yeah, very interestingly, this is kind of like a follow-up paper uh, by Google. The uh, some, some, some from the same team that uh, came up with the original transformer. So now they use a universal transformer, which actually tries to add back recurrence in their transformer. All right, so it's quite interesting. You 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 still see that maybe they it can't it can't achieve uh, what uh, different things that well. So maybe you still need some form of recurrence, uh, or actually to perhaps make it Turing complete. They they they've uh, come up with this to see whether uh, this this improves. So have a look at this paper as well. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, because ultimately what you're really interested in doing is you're learning, you're trying to let the, the network learn representations to solve your problem. So as long as the, the, you, you can structure it in such a way that it, you think it can help it to learn a good representation for your task, they, they, they can all achieve uh, the same thing. But implementation-wise, transformers are actually quite hard to do. I've, tr I've tried coding one in TensorFlow already. Uh, I mean, there's the PyTorch one, which is very good. Uh, there's, a, there's a link on, uh, on the slide. I tried to convert into TensorFlow, but it was a uh, really night real nightmare. Otherwise, I would have shown it, but uh, it's it's it, yeah. So TensorFlow is getting there, I think. But uh, I mean, I'm trying very hard to love it, but you know, it's really not working out this relationship. So the the thing is that um, for transformers, it's it's very it's very fiddly. It's very very fiddly. It's um, a lot of things really need to come together. It's it's a uh, it's not. I mean, it's not ready yet. I think for for like. Um, Engineering applied applied uh, applications. I think maybe you're doing uh, state of the art stuff. You you want to try a transformer, but it's really not so easy to to, to get it to work. You, there's a lot. Of, I mean, I don't know. It's a lot of like trying stuff and then just training and training, and it's like oh, not working, and, and it takes very long to train. So it's uh, I mean, it's fast, but you want to use it for very very big problems, right? So you don't use it for like small toy problems. So it's it's uh, yeah. I, I I don't don't really think it's it's ready yet. Okay, so for the okay, at least for the for the transformer um, original paper attention all you, is all you need. Uh, there were a lot of other things that they, they did as well, which 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 combined together. I mean, like there's byte pair encoding, there is a beam search with a, a language penalty, and there's a lot of things that uh, length penalty. There are a lot of things that they put together, uh, and of course they also had this weird atom and uh, this for transformers you need to have this weird. Uh, schedule for your learning rate, which has to like start from very low and go up and then go back down again, which is uh, <laughs> which is re really very hard to very hard to, to apply. You know, it's it's a uh, quite quite uh, hacky. I feel, yeah. So, I mean, if you're just trying to publish a paper, you want to get very good results once or twice, then you, you can go for a transformer. I feel, but for for engineering purposes, I think it's still not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Take one last question over there. Yeah. No, uh, like LSTM, RNS, you can, yeah. yeah. So they are very stable. You can use them to achieve the same thing. Okay, so, so, 
Okay, so this, this paper is quite interesting because specifically for NMT, it did a very good ablation uh, for the different architectures, even including CNNs as well. You can have a look at it and see you know, what, what, what they've uh, found. Yeah. No wrong. So I think uh, all of you understand that you're looking really at state-of-the-art stuff that's not very old. People don't know what's going on yet. And uh, if you take this course again next year, you'll be just put together the same thing. So uh, you know, take it, everything with a pinch of salt. This is just the current thinking. Uh, just because of the age of acceleration and GitHub, you have the availability of the code now. And you can be just as lost as the rest of the world. You know, and uh, trying to apply and reach out. Why the heck are they doing that? And it's not really clear, right? So, um, yeah, it's an exciting time. I think a lot of it will consolidate eventually. So now, I, uh, just like uh, uh, Hao Kang said, you know, five years ago when RNNs and LSDNs first came out, people were saying they were very fiddly, you know, they, they couldn't be optimized. And now we have a much better understanding of how they work and uh, people are more comfortable with it. So it will come, uh, it's just not going to come readily right away, right? And there's a lot of computations that are being discarded, the masks that are being uh, put there is because, well, they work, not because they're theoretically smart way to do it, uh, probably definitely not pedagogically friendly, you know, <laughs> do computations and start them. Um, so uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to uh, take a look. But if you get the general spirit of it, of it, I mean, all of you in this room are, are at the point where you could participate in this uh, research agenda, because you're only about, what, three or four months behind what the current state-of-the-art teams are doing, albeit with a lot more resources, so it's CPU-wise, you know, they can afford to burn how many uh, bits of electricity. Okay, so uh, we'll hand it over to Kathy Nori to uh, do the CNN part. Okay, so, so let's first have another round of applause for uh, yeah. Okay, from now on, uh, I'm going to uh, explain about uh, convolutional neural network for NLP. Yep. So why CNN for NLP? So uh, does anyone, fam uh, I mean, uh, anyone familiar with uh, uh, CNN? Like, okay, great. So yeah, as you may know, like CNN is very popular uh, deep neural network architecture for image recognition. Yeah, it made a, a great success. And the, so a few weeks, a few years back, a researcher come up with a, a CNN for NLP. And the, actually in some of application, uh, it works uh, very well. But uh, as far as I know, uh, most uh, main application is uh, for text classification rather than uh, like translation. Like uh, text classification, such as a sentiment analysis, like uh, let's say, like we have a like a Amazon review or movie review text, then like uh, classify this review is has a po positive opinion or negative opinion, uh, etc. But yeah, actually there is also like a paper associated with a CNN with a tra uh, translation, but uh, this is uh, just a combining a CNN and RNN for translation. So pure CNN uh, application is uh, like mainly. I think uh, text classification up to this point of time. So why we use uh, CNN? So what's the motivation? So you basically uh, CNN is uh, basically faster than uh, RNN uh, because of the nature of uh, architecture. Because uh, yeah, as you see, uh, RNN is a kind kind of a uh, like sequential process to processing uh, uh, using the previous uh, hidden layers uh, output. But uh, basically, CNN is uh, like more easily parallelized, which means that it uh, can uh, make it more faster using a uh, GPU or TPU, uh, etc. So, also, uh, CNN has uh, like good properties. So, let's say like I have uh, like a sentence or te like a text, whole text, then, and uh, what I want to do is that just do uh, like classification. In that case, uh, uh, we don't need like not necessary to like consider the sequence of words. Yeah, we just uh, want to know like this text is uh, like has a positive opinion or negative opinion. In that case, uh, we don't need to like do a sequential processing. And the some uh, some uh, somewhat uh, CN is good at capturing uh, like kind of a uh, indicator from the whole text because uh, compared to RN. 
like a uh, oh it's a uh, format condition. Okay, so yeah, as we uh yeah, as we discussed uh, earlier, so basically RN processing uh, text one by one using the previous uh, uh, input. Uh, so let's say we have uh, like phrase the country of my bus. Then uh, basically RN process uh, one uh, word by word uh, sequentially, but uh, C uh, CNN can like compute vectors for every possible phrase. For example, like the country of my bus, uh, we take just a uh, bigram, then we can like do a composition using uh, like first two characters, the country, also do some composition for uh, using a country of, or, of my, uh, et cetera, and uh, computing some scalar value and uh, like using this outcome for uh, classification task. So this is uh, yeah, more easily like uh, parallelized compared to RN, RNN. Yeah, this is one of the motivation why we use R, uh, we can use a CN for classification. Yeah. So, uh, do you know the meaning or definition of the convolution? Are you familiar with that? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. If many people know the, yeah. So, yeah, convolution, yeah, actually this word can be seen like in many areas such as uh, like Fourier transformation or, yeah, even uh, like image processing, yeah, in any places. But basically, yeah, combination is very good at uh, extracting features, features from input data. And combination is just a kind of uh, like element-wise multiplication and summing up uh, uh, like result of uh, multiplication and like between filters and inputs. Like for example, like uh, for NLP problem, uh, we use a uh, one dimensional uh, convolution and the formula looks like this. Yeah, this is a just uh, like uh, multiplying a uh, fun uh, function f and g and just taking a sum, summing up uh, across the uh, windows. So, for example, like in this example, like uh, NLP problem, uh, we could say function f is a just input, input, uh, input word and g is a like value of filters. Also, uh, we can think of a uh, two-dimensional convolution, which is uh, commonly used for image, image reco uh, recognition. Like uh, F is uh, just input pixel of image, and G is also uh, like a value of filters. Yeah, because like, uh, you know, uh, so image is a kind of two-dimensional array, and uh, each element has a pix value of pixels to represent uh, uh, like brightness of the uh, like uh, pictures. Yeah, uh, I think it's better to show some kind of illustration to understand like how convol convolution works. So this is a kind of processing flow. So let's say uh, we have uh, like input x from x1 to x4, and each x uh, and each x represents uh, some kind of word, and we we apply a, f a filter uh, window uh, whose window size is a two. Then uh, convolution is just doing kind of a inner inner product to computing a uh, feature map Z. Yeah. Then uh, what we do is just sliding a window and apply same uh, filter to generate a new feature map. Yep. So basically, yeah, uh, feature map is uh, just uh, like a result of the like in, uh, total product of the between uh, input value and the filter value. And the training convolution neural network is uh, nothing but uh, just like a fa uh, training uh, optimal weight of weight of uh, filter to achieve some uh, objective. Like uh, let's say uh, we are going to build uh, some classifier and the we train neural network and the uh, the purpose of training is to finding an uh, optimal parameter W. W is uh, just a value, like a weight of the uh, filter to like make a uh, classification better. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you okay for that? <laughs> are you with yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. 
care about doing and how they compute their values. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to explain uh, like concrete example for yeah. So this is uh, along with a paper written by Kim, 2014. The paper is a convolutional neural network for sentence classification. Uh, as far as I know, this is our like first paper to use uh, CNN for text classification. And in this paper, uh, basically, uh, Kim tried to like a uh, uh, to uh, classify uh, like seven types of text. Uh, like uh, text file, uh, sentences, like uh, movie reviews, uh, and and the classification is that basically this is a kind of sentiment analysis, like a uh, binary classification. If this review is a positive opinion or a negative opinion, yeah. Uh, we also have a different type of uh, sentiment uh, analysis data, SSD one, which has uh, like five levels, like very positive or positive neutral negative or very negative. Also has a like, different type of uh, classification uh, problem, like uh, sub this uh, sentence is a subjective or objective. Understand? Yeah, so in this paper, like there are like five, uh, roughly speaking, there are five like uh, technical highlights, like convolutional layer uh, to extract a feature uh, from the sentence. Also, uh, like mentioned about the uh, max over time pooling layer and the multi uh, channel architecture and the fully connected layer with softmax. Also, he uh, came up with a regularization technique for building a robust model. Okay, I can explain one by one. So, yeah, this is the like, uh, whole architecture of the uh, CN, C CNN uh, tested by Kim. So, for example, like we have a uh, like sentence input, like wait for the video and do, uh, do not rent it. So basically, uh, so input uh, can be encoded as a, uh, by the uh, word to vector. Uh, and uh, we got the uh, like word embed, uh, embedding, uh, embedding uh, expression. And each word has a, a K, K dimension. Uh, I, I remember like, K was uh, like uh, 300 dimension, yeah, as far as I remember. So uh, we input uh, like uh, embedded uh, uh, word, ve word, uh, word vector to CNN and uh, apply the convolutional layer and the uh, pass through the max pooling layer. After that, uh, make a classification using a uh, soft max. Yeah, so firstly, I'm Explain about uh, convolutional layer. The purpose of uh, convolutional layer is uh, just uh, extract a import, uh, extract a uh, feature, which means uh, like generating a feature map from a given sentence. Yep. Okay, so this is a, a chart to explain how convolutional layer works. So basically, uh, we can express word vector as a, a like this way, like x, x i represents uh, each word vector uh, which has a k, k dimi uh, dimension. Like for example, like we have an uh, input text, story, uh, text like uh, the country of my bus. Then uh, we can uh, represent uh, each word uh, one by one, like the equal x1 and the country equal x2 and so on. And uh, each word has a, like, uh, it represented as a like, uh, word embed uh, with a word embed, uh, embedding, yeah. So what convolutional uh, layer do, does do, uh, is doing is that, uh, yeah, just apply filter in the certain, uh, sa uh, in the certain windows. Like for example, like in this example, uh, we set a uh, window size equals three, which means we are like doing convolution operation across the like three se uh, uh, sequent uh, three words. Like uh, we uh, we apply filter the uh, first three words the country of. Then uh, after that uh, we got some like a uh, scalar value. Yeah, and the convolution 
operation can be expressed as uh, such, uh, like uh, uh, this formula, like uh, uh, just uh, like uh, uh, weight multiply uh, w multiply x. W is just the weight of the filter, uh, which should be like train uh, changed during the back propagation training. And actually, yeah, this is, this formula is uh, uh, just for uh, like neural network uh, like uh, comp uh, feed forward computation formula. It's just exactly the same as one. So yeah, just multiply input and the uh, weight value and uh, plus uh, bias term. Then uh, we got some like a uh, scalar value C1. Uh, we call this this as a feature feature one. So uh, we can just do a convolution uh, operation uh, use, uh, just applying the filter one by one. Like so, first, firstly we apply uh, we uh, com we do a com uh, convolution from x one x two x three. Then uh, we uh, we uh, we just slide the uh, window uh, with a slide one like. Then up, up uh, doing the same, uh, same applying same operation from x to x three x four, and apply same uh, filter x three x four x five. After that, we got the three scalar value. Uh, yeah, this is a like feature map uh, we want to have. Yeah, uh, we call it. Uh, it this is a like narrow convolution, but uh, actually. Uh, we also do like a different stuff like uh, for example like in previous example uh, we just have uh, only three feature map because uh, the length of sentences are just five so we cannot uh, we only can uh, generate a three feature map because of this but the, some researcher also try to like make make a, num a feature map more like to try to increase the number of feature map, applying some like a uh, zero padding method. Yeah, this is called uh, so-called wide convolution. And the in Kim's paper, uh, I'm not sure if Kim used uh, this zero padding method or not. Yeah, because there is no like uh, explicitly mentioned here. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, so. Yeah, as a result, uh, result of com uh, like convolutional layer, so we got some like a uh, number, of, uh, some uh, like a scalar bunch bunch of uh, scalar values. Uh, we call it a feature map. Then we are going to apply max over <coughs> time pooling uh, layer. The purpose of uh, applying pooling layer is uh, just to capture the sig uh, signal from the feature map. So in this paper, uh, like here applied the max pooling layer to uh, like uh, capture the uh, important signal. Like uh, this is a, a very simple operation, just taking a maximum value given the like three scalar, scalar value in this example. Like <clears throat> this is an example uh, just to get uh, like three feet, like scalar value of the from the feature map because uh, we like uh, apply. Uh, this method as a three polygram. Then uh, we got the three scalar value, and uh, okay, uh, C2 has a value 3.5. Uh, okay, this is a maximum. Then let's just take it and just leave it C, C1 and C3. Yep. So, uh, do you, so does anyone uh, like have any idea why we do? Like a such a like pulling apply pulling method because we just uh, like uh, discarding uh, inf information like uh, and just uh, taking a maximum value. So intuitively, like uh, we just uh, we are just losing, losing the information, but we do that. Uh, do, you, do you have any idea why we do that? Yeah. 
right? We're, we're taking several values and applying a max or a min function over that to other values, right? So using a, a two by two pooling, basically you're getting rid of three values and just keeping the fourth highest or lowest value. Right, so you can think of it in the image sense, right? Uh, so when you look at an image and you want to detect whether a certain uh, part of the image has something, right? You run your image detector over all parts of the image, right? And uh, if there is a certain item in that image, you want it to fire yes, right? So I could take a picture here and say there is a clock in, in this image because there is one on the back wall, right? But uh, if I if I do some kind of average over all the things, you know, um, then I won't get a, an activation that says there's a clock, right? What I want to do is something like attention to say that there's only a part of the image that has the, the feature of the clock, and I'm trying to propagate that up. So uh, other parts that are not being fired, let's say, for the rest of the classroom, if I take this image here, right? The parts uh, that don't have a clock should fire low, right? So they should have a close to zero activation, right? But the part that did see the clock should have a firing of one. So ultimately, when I want to label this piece, uh, this picture as having a clock, right? Then I would like to know that at least part of the picture found the clock, right? So there are lots of different cases in in both vision and, and natural language processing where it's like attention you're attending to specific part of the image or a specific part of the sentence and saying whether that particular item has some work, right? So in natural language processing, uh, the, the canonical example would be sentiment analysis, right? So we would say that certain words in a sentence tell you the sentiment, right? Most of the words are not going to be very representative of the sentence, right? So that's why pulling the So as Prof told, uh, like in NLP context, uh, my understanding is that like we took a max pooling layer to capture like strong signal which indicate, uh, let's say like this sen sentence saying uh, like positive stuff or negative stuff. But we never know like a strong signal, a fair strong signal uh, come up with. For example, like I like a, I write a review such as uh, I hate this movie. I do, I dislike. It this movie or uh, I, I don't uh, like this movie at all. Yeah, which is a uh, like, strong in indicator to, for sentiment analysis, which this uh, information should be extracted. But the, we, we never know like such a strong signal uh, fair to appear like a, second, like a second word of the sentence or third word of, of sentence or fourth. Uh, we, ne we, ne uh, we don't know, but the, uh, we, we want to extract this information given this sentence. Then uh, Max Pooling, uh, help us to capture such a strong signal. And, uh, yeah. Also, so, I do, uh, yeah. Also, the reason why we are using a, a max pooling layer is just capturing a strong signal, but the in image processing, like some researcher uh, do uh, apply like uh, some pooling or average pooling for, yeah, some purposes, but in this paper, uh, Kim uses max pooling, uh, Max Spring, uh, maybe uh, simply because he would like to capture like st strong ind indicator. Yep. Yeah, and also we, we can do similar stuff for different uh, chunk of verb. Uh, last example, uh, I showed uh, like completion operation using a tri uh, uh, trigram uh, data, but technically we can do uh, exactly the same thing using uh, for the uh, bigram data. And uh, it's better to do to apply multiple filter on on the uh, different chunk of words uh, because we it's better to have uh, like many features to make a decision if this uh, sentence is has a like positive opinion or negative opinion. So yeah, we can do like uh, we can try uh, to apply filter yeah, different uh, n gram. And in this example, like we do a 
by graph and the, okay, I found oh, C4 has the most strongest signal, then uh, let's take only C4 as a result of uh, pulling layer. Yep. Also, uh, Kim uh, tried, uh, like, uh, un uh, unique, uh, tried uh, unique attempt for the, like, uh, which is multi channel architecture. So, basically, uh, what Kim did is that he pre uh, prepared two same uh, input data. Like, we have an uh, input sentence, but the team just copy and create two uh, same input data. And both of them were like pre trained by using a word to back, using a uh, like Google News data set. And uh, what he tried, did is that uh, during back propagation training, uh, like, he designed the architecture like uh, to also ch like uh, modifying a, a, like a word vector value for like a no, uh, non-static channel. And we also have a different input as a static channel, which will not be modified during training. And he just uh, like apply filter in each, apply same filter in each channel and uh, ma uh, sum up a result to make a, uh, like a final output. Uh, that is, I think the reason why he tried to do so is that just, just avoiding uh, overheating. So, uh, for example, like uh, if we only use a, like a non-static channel, then uh, what, what representation also will be uh, modified during back propagation. So, in that case, uh, we may have a risk to risk, a, risk for the like overheating. Yeah. So, which means that like. Uh, like he created two input and all uh, like applying a filter one by one. Like for example, like this example, like uh, uh, this is a like static channel, and he tried to apply filter for the like bigram data. Also, he tried to apply trigram uh, data for, for the compression layer. Also, he. He did, uh, try to apply filter for non-static channel uh, and creating uh, like uh, many feature maps and uh, 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 taking up uh, max uh, like applying for max during layer and uh, go through the uh, pass through the uh, uh, soft uh, soft max layer to uh, to make a uh, like classification. Okay, so uh, final part is uh, just just uh, very simple, like apply to the softmax uh, with uh, some regularization technique. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so yeah, just uh, uh, input uh, like uh, using the output of the max pre layer as the input of the softmax function, and uh, yeah, co computing uh, like probability for like. Uh, this uh, probability uh, of like uh, this uh, sentence has a positive positive opinion or negative opinion uh, and so on. But uh, to avoid the overheating, uh, he applied uh, like a uh, uh, dropout method. Yep. And uh, so in this paper, like he did uh, some hyperparameter tuning and he found that like dropout rate uh, 0 0.5 yield the uh, best result according to his uh, trial. Yeah, uh, so dropout is, uh, here is a very simple, like uh, original softmax function is just softmax, uh, like uh, argument is uh, like multiply w, weight w and the uh, output output of the max pulling layer Z and plus bias term. But the, on top of that, he defined uh, like masking vector, which takes a uh, random variable zero or one, and the, like, the probability of taking one value one is uh, like 50%, and also taking uh, value zero is, is also 50%, like, and two, uh, yeah. So during a uh, 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 training, uh, gradient uh, only uh, pro back propagated only through uh, those elements who has uh, like uh, 
who has not masked uh, by the uh, by uh, who has not masked uh, by the uh, uh, vector R. And the uh, during the uh, inference, uh, there is no dropout, but the to to normalize the uh, outcome, uh, he just uh, multiply uh, probability and the weight value W. So, and if, uh, his final model is uh, like P equals 0 0.5, so he just uh, multiplies 0 0.5 to normalize the result to, uh, to avoid to like uh, exploding the outcome. And actually, yeah, uh, so dropout was effective, and he reported that like two to four percent accuracy improvement was observed by using a uh, uh, <coughs> dropout. Also, he also uh, applied to uh, L two regularization, uh, which is very simple, like to make a uh, weight value more uh, more smaller to avoid overfitting. And the, during the training time, if uh, the absolute value of the weight uh, exceeds a certain amount, then just capping the uh, weight value as a S. And the so final model, his final model is S equal uh, three, as far as I, I remember. So this is a hyperparameter he applied for building a final model. Activation function is a, a, a rectified linear unit, a feature commonly used in image uh, recognition problem. And he uh, applied uh, three filter, like filter, food, uh, food size is a three, four, and five, and setting a drop rate as a 0 0.5, and the yeah, L2 constraints for either uh, equal three, and he used the word, uh, pre-trained word vectors uh, whose dimension has a uh, 300. Yeah, so yeah, this is a, a result. And uh, just comparing uh, like his proposed uh, classifier and comparing other commonly used class, classifiers such as a SVM or other neural network architecture. And his uh, CNN classifier achieved the uh, like best score, like four, uh, four, four of seven, uh, in, uh, there are seven uh, data set and the, among them, like four of them, uh, like a best, a best classifier, classifier was uh, like CNN, uh, CNN based one. So, yeah, at the time, I think it was a, a very uh, like good result. Yeah, question. Yeah. So, I'm curious how you can have a comparable to the other one. Mm hmm. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, yeah, I agree with you. So, actually, even yeah, there are some point to be discussed because uh, actually this is not a perfect apple to apple comparison. Yeah, because uh, in this paper, like he applies some like a yes, yeah, 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 and but I think like as a neural network model also sh should be also like considered to apply like a big realization drop part uh, and uh, yeah any. Also, like other stuff which is used for CNN, CNN model. Otherwise, it's like uh, not a fair comparison. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, you are right. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, CNNs uh, originate much more from computer vision. So a lot of the techniques about those are about outcome from there. If you're a vision person, that should be pretty familiar. RNN should be pretty boring in. in um, vision processes. But uh, you know, the idea that uh, Kim came up with you know, when he was a, just a beginning student uh, was to, to apply the CNN architecture to things that people thought it wouldn't work, right? Because CNNs uh, just take locality in different space, but they don't take it to the state space, the sequence to sequence stuff that are RNN, right? So, um, I think a lot of people have gone back and said, okay, maybe we don't need the RNN, right? Uh, we don't need to do this because the RNN has this big, big serial constraint, right? Which doesn't take any advantage of 
of the parallel computation architecture that we have in GPT. Right? So the Google folks said, uh, heck, we'll just compute everything. And so they came up with the transform. Right? And then um, the CNN folks said, you know, well, we won't compute everything, but we'll compute everything in a local window, and, and you get the CNN architecture on that. So uh, there, there are two competing, competing ideas for approximating what uh, a Markovian model, which is like the RNA. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, as I told earlier, so, yeah, there is also have an application for uh, translation, but this is not a pure CNN, CNN application, yeah, it's a com combination of CNN and RNA. So yeah, basically, main application could be uh, like text classification uh, at this point of time. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to explain about ch character level CNN. Actually, this topic is not included on original Stanford lecture, but the, I personally have an interest for this area, and I just add it by myself. So, so the CNN for NLP uh, that I have been explained is that uh, for, it's a kind of word level CNN, CNN, but we may apply CNN for character, each character level. And uh, so the possible advantage could be model might be more robust against the typos and the misspelling. Yeah, because we are like treating uh, not the word level, but the uh, uh, character level. So let's say I made a typo on uh, Amazon review, then uh, the word will be like a not like uh, it will be like a represent as a di different uh, like a di different value as a, like uh, how do you say? Uh, so we do we use a word to vector but the, if I made a mistake on this spelling then this word is not like a same represented as a like original one yeah but uh, we if we do like character level encoding uh, it could be uh, yeah more robust. And the, uh, this property is uh, like useful for, especially for uh, like playing with a human return sentence, such as uh, like Amazon review or WhatsApp chat. Yeah, we, yeah, we are every day make, making uh, many ty typos, I think. But the, like for example, like in newspaper, maybe many editor review on the paper before uh, are publishing. So in that case, maybe yeah, there's, there are like only a few typo or no, no typos. Yeah. It depends on like uh, characteristics of the uh, document that we're gonna play with. Yeah. Also, good to think of uh, character level CNN could be we can apply for this method for not only uh, like a document like a hum human written document, but also we can apply some string such as a URL or a source code. Uh, I'm gonna explain uh, detail later. Yeah. And. Also good thing is that we can play with the data with a raw input. So, yeah, actually this is Japanese, so can anyone understand the Japanese? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Uh, or can anyone understand the Chinese? Yeah, yeah, I think many of them, yeah. So, yeah, yeah basically, yeah, English has uh, like white space between words, so it's very easy to word segmentation. But, uh, like, Chinese and the Japanese, there are no white spaces, yeah, as you can see here. So this means that kind of I study deep learning for NLP, but there is no white space. So which means uh, we need to do something to like, uh, like uh, separating a word. So yeah, actually it's a bit tricky and there are some good algorithm and library to do that, but the, sometimes, yeah, the quality of bug segmentation, segmentation affects the like a uh, post process. So, but for if we use a character level CNN, we don't need to worry about the uh, word segmentation process. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, also like, if, uh, every algorithm has uh, some like shortfall, like in this case, uh, this advantage is uh, like model training time uh, should be longer because we are like uh, applying a method for more fine, fine grain, like a more granular size of data. So compared to uh, word level CNN. Yeah. So uh, nowadays, uh, some paper published, published associated with the uh, character level CNN. And uh, as far as I know, this is the first paper uh, 
uh, like discussing about this topic. So this is also application is a text classification and attempted by using a C character level CNN. And uh, also the uniqueness of this paper is uh, data augmentation was also uh, employed. So do you know about uh, data augmentation? Yeah, some of them are. Not familiar? Can we talk about that for a little while? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so why don't we go over data augmentation? Um, that's, that's how Kenoi is going to explain it for, for work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so okay, so I think this concept is come from the image pro recognition problem first. So basically, so CNN is a very powerful. Uh, are very powerful for doing uh, like classification, but problem is that like CN CNN has uh, so many parameters to be estimated by back, back, back propagation. So which means that uh, we need to like uh, so vast amount of the training data to like uh, uh, model make a uh, model more robust to avoid uh, overfitting. <laughs> yeah, this is a problem. So especially for image processing problem, then like some smart researcher. Ha, like come up with some idea to generating generating a more training data using uh, data uh, so which is uh, so called data augmentation like let's say uh, I'm going to build a, like uh, image detec detection CNN and uh, I want to like uh, classify this picture is uh, like cat or uh, uh, yeah something else in that case we can just provide like, like cat image data to make to training but uh, what we can do is that like we can like artificially like modifying the image like such as uh, like uh, rotating or uh, like uh, sliding or uh, adding some noise uh, artificially then we can treat some, uh, this data as a new training data but uh, it's more re uh, less likely to overfitting because uh, data is like uh, not the same as original one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah, so it's definitely like uh, adding noise, right? It's just that the, we want to hallucinate more data so that uh, we, we won't focus it, right? So it's to address general location. So when we do it for images, uh, usually you do some type of cropping or scaling of the image, uh, and you provide that as an additional training uh, data so that uh, the parameters of your network won't uh, over fit the, the particularities of your data set. You do have to be careful in some domains that uh, you don't make data that doesn't make sense. So, uh, uh, for example, if you're doing envision, uh, looking at scans of the human body, uh, they tell you you shouldn't flip the images left, right. Okay, why? Why? Because people aren't symmetrical. If you look at, let's say, a, a chest x-ray, your heart only has to be on one side. If you flip the heart to the other side, there's something wrong with you as a human being, right? So um, you, you, you have to be uh, careful when you, you uh, manufacture new data. So uh, when we do the data augmentation for natural language processing, you also have to make sure that uh, the sentences or, or the uh, the new pieces of information that you're you're giving to the system don't uh, overly uh, break the system. So uh, you know you can uh, replace them using synonyms. Uh, word vectors is already trying to address that to uh, quite a large extent is to put uh, synonyms together in the same space. But this is just yet another strategy to combat uh, overfitting. Yep. Okay. So. Yeah, so I'm talking about the uh, quantization, like which is uh, just uh, generating an uh, input vector. So, uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, we are going to like input uh, like character level data to uh, CNN, which means we need to do some encoding. So, in this paper, basically, yeah, just trying like very simple stuff, like a kind of one hot encoding. So, basically, we yeah, are in this paper targeting on, like only for English sentences. So, and just just to define like seventy target characters by the alphabet, and they 
number and some special characters and yeah just uh, make a <coughs> and just encoding as a yeah one hot encoding and and the apply a uh, convolutional layer and the max pooling layer uh, but different thing is that apply like multiple convolution and the max pooling layer yeah to make a crash fire yeah so that paper we uh, we have uh, discussed uh, last time is uh, like it's a it was uh, actually not so deep deep uh, like deep, uh, deep neural network just only have a one convolution layer and the one max pooling layer but in this paper uh, uh, yeah they are trying to like uh, make a network deeper maybe like uh, I think the reason behind it is that like the character level uh, neural network should be more like have a more like difficult and compli complicated relationship. So in that case, like deeper network help to make a crash fire better, I think. But actually the number of uh, like layer is also a hyperparameter. So I think that also try to like multiple pattern of neural network and the, I, as a result of uh, hyperparameter tuning, I, I think they come up with this is the best one. So, but uh, I think no one can tell why this number of layers is uh, optimal for this problem. So uh, this is the data set uh, he, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they have ever edited. So they are two, four, six. Yeah, they are eight, eight, uh, eight, uh, eight uh, types of data set. And the, basically, uh, yeah, seven of the data set is uh, written by uh, English. But second data set is uh, written by Chinese. So also tried to like romanize uh, a Chinese text in uh, to to make it alphabet uh, alphabet sentences. Yeah, because uh, yeah, as we seen, <coughs> we only uh, have have uh, like encoding pattern like uh, alphabet and the number and the special character. So but so which means we cannot directly input a Chinese character into model. So yeah, and uh, result is uh, like this. So. The blue, blue is the best and the red is the worst. So, and the, the model that uh, also were uh, proposing is uh, like that, uh, the, uh, this model, like uh, uh, surrounded by uh, like circle. <coughs> so, yeah, basically, so like what we can say is that there is a full data set and the in the four, four data, uh, there, uh, there, is, uh, there are eight data set, and in the four data set, uh, proposed model uh, performed the best. And uh, one of the conclusion could be, uh, if uh, like we have a like big data set, then uh, character level CNN, CNN uh, perform, performs better. Uh, because uh, this is a like, uh, size of data set, and the Last of all, data set has uh, like very like a um, mi uh, mi uh, million uh, several millions of uh, records. So, <clears throat> and these four data set, so uh, proposed model performs the best. So, which means that, uh, so if we have a uh, like vast amount of uh, training data set, then uh, yeah, we can like uh, we can expect expect a like better result of using a uh, character level CNN. But also, uh, like also say, said that like uh, there is no free lunch. So which means, uh, uh, are you familiar? Uh, have you ever heard about the uh, no free lunch theorem? Anyone want to summarize what it is? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, who does know what the no free lunch theorem? Okay, Daniel. That's right. So the idea is that uh, each type of optimization or each type of algorithm has its inherent uh, pluses and minuses. If you try to apply the same technique for every column, they are, they'll probably be equally as good as any other technique. Right. So um, if each, each of the different uh, methods will have its strengths and weaknesses, and you need to uh, 
uh, apply the appropriate techniques to meet the problem. Uh, we don't have an Uber algorithm that uh, is able to meet everything. Yeah, but actually, like, even so, yeah, such a like uh, reality, but uh, this proposal model uh, performed very well for especially for big data sets. Uh, I think it's a good uh, find, uh, finding. Yeah. So that's generally the case when you have uh, you know, more parameters to estimate, you have a more powerful model, so it should work better on larger data sets. Like that, that should be fairly obvious because uh, you have more parameters, you have more, more uh, power to fit. I may have told many of you uh, earlier, you know, when you look at deep learning research, you really have to pay attention to the data set size, right? Sometimes the data set size tells you more about whether it will work well than the model architecture. You know, you could use a, a simple RNN and maybe you get the same results uh, because it just has the right amount of parameters, then, then something that's carefully So it's, it's often the case when you want to read deep learning papers Right. You might try, let's say, the same type of model, but because it's uh, over-parameterized with respect to your data set, you'll just get terrible over Yeah, uh, <clears> Okay, so next, I introduced uh, another interesting work. Yeah, this is also uh, applying a character-level convolution neural, neural network, but uh, yeah, playing with different type of data, storing uh, characters, uh, like a uh, natural, uh, like uh, storing data. So, so lastly, uh, <clears throat> they are trying to like classify something for a sentence. But in this paper, they uh, also try to like classify for like non-human little uh, sentence, such as a URL or like a suspe suspicious file pass or like registry keys. To identify like which URL is is a like is a some kind of like a risky or like cracker, ha, like a embedded uh, like virus and so on. So <clears throat> yeah, it's a like very tricky but interesting problem. Yeah, because uh, this is a like uh, not not uh, like sentence or not like a human written phrase at all. Yeah, this is just a, like a bunch of uh, combination of characters. But also try to find some like a pattern to identify which character has uh, like some kind of risk of uh, like uh, <coughs> hacking or yeah, etc. And the also unique thing of this paper is uh, like lastly uh, <coughs> for like uh, CN input character was encode, encoded to using a one hot encoding, but in this paper uh, character level uh, <coughs> embedded encoding was attempted. Like for example, like uh, this is a, a bit difficult to see, but this is a kind of URL www dot something, and the W has a some kind of distributed representation, and each word has a uh, distributed this, uh, representation. So this such an encoding is uh, like uh, di different from a uh, uh, last paper I introduced. And so, but other stuff is a very similar architecture, like applying a convolutional layer and the applying a like pooling layer. But in this paper, uh, also using uh, like uh, some pooling layer rather than max pooling layer. But actually, uh, I couldn't find why they use the uh, like some pooling layer rather than max pooling layer. But I guess this is also as a result of hyperparameter tuning. I guess, yep, and. So basically, and uh, so input is uh, like input character is encoded uh, using a uh, like <coughs> embedded encoding uh, method, and uh, uh, in the convolutional layer, uh, like uh, windows, uh, they also use different windows si window size, such as uh, like ex uh, apply convolutional filter for like a sequential two character or a three character, four character, five character. Then uh, apply a, like a, some, apply to a sampling layer and uh, also you uh, use the 
uh, drop out and then uh, input to the uh, <coughs> fully connected layer for make a classification. Do you guys have any idea why something was used in this paper rather than uh, masking? Actually, I. <coughs> I think it's the case where we have a very few positive examples, and it's also the need to address the sampling issues, right? Because probably if you have a lot of URLs, most of them are legit. So uh, using assumptions might help with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is an uh, experimental result. So in this paper, uh, they use uh, AUC as a evaluation criteria, and the, yeah, they try like three types of data set. Uh, one is a URL or file pass or uh, like Windows re registry key. And the basically, like proposed uh, method uh, achieved the uh, best score uh, among, among the all types of data set. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. But uh, what I'm thinking is that, like, basically, like, uh, every method has uh, achieved a very high AUC value. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to see, uh, like, a uh, more, like, difficult data set to, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, I want to see a uh, performance, yeah. But. I think it's just that AUC is not a book Yeah. <laughs> because there's such a skew in the data set. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, this is a final topic. So also, uh, I found uh, like interesting uh, attempt, especially for like Japanese text mining. I'm sorry because I'm Japanese, so <laughs> I just find uh, like Japanese paper. So yeah, so there, like, yeah, first one is uh, like Jap uh, first paper is a uh, like, Japanese text classification by like uh, CN, but also using a transfer learning. And. So the interesting thing of this paper is that uh, basically like, they are comparing like a uh, two way of the uh, what, what, uh, input encoding. One is just like uh, romanization uh, Japanese text, as as I uh, discussed earlier. Also, try to apply a character level embeddings, embeddings uh, as well. <coughs> but uh, I think Chinese also same. But the also yeah Japanese also has a yeah basically has a problem to do a one hot encoding because yeah there are like more than two thousand unique character is daily used in Japanese. Even uh, I don't know like exact figure like how, how many Japanese characters exist. So uh, hence uh, therefore so uh, one hot encoding is uh, like not like a practic practical way to do encoding so yeah so this uh, this is the reason why I yeah, also try to yeah, Roma uh, romanization and the character level embedding, uh, embeddings for this problem. Yeah, also uh, applying transfer learning. So are you familiar? Uh, have you ever heard about the transfer learning? I think it's famous in the image processing uh, area. So yeah, transfer learning is uh, like roughly speaking like uh, just just like uh, building uh, like uh, just how do I say like just just uh, using a uh, weight value which are uh, like trained by using another data set like uh, let's say like Google has a very big large set data uh, very big data set and uh, like they try something for specific neural network architecture then what I can do is I just copy the weight value from the model built by Google, and then I add a new data set for my purpose. Then, so, so, then, uh, like, 
uh, so, uh, I can build a, a, a robust model uh, uh, compared to I just use my own small data set. So it's a kind of idea of transfer learning, like uh, yeah, using a, like someone's like a very good model and to, to add a more, like, to make a, uh, my uh, model more robust. <coughs> yeah, so it's commonly used in image uh, recognition application, but the, yeah, this also, to, uh, also try to apply transfer learning and the, they are reporting that like transfer line, by using transfer line, uh, make a model more accurate. <coughs> uh, also, uh, there's another paper, like it's a like document classification, but using a uh, uh, image recognition uh, CNN, like uh, <coughs> uh, because, uh, yeah, so target application is like uh, document classification, especially for Japanese text. But they are like not, not using a word embedding, but a word embedding or like one hot encoding stuff. They just uh, use a cap, like a uh, user character as an image and doing uh, apply for uh, image recognition uh, method. Because I guess like Japanese has a like a kind of a how do I say? It? Japanese uh, like each Japanese character. Like a uh, composed of some like a uh, parts, and each part has uh, like similar meaning. Like uh, this part is uh, representing a tree, or uh, this part representing uh, like fire or uh, flame or something. And uh, yeah, Japanese sentence is like uh, just uh, combining each part. I think Chinese also same. Yeah, maybe uh, th this is a reason why yeah this method worked well. Yeah, yeah uh, that's all. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a big hand for both of our speakers today. Okay, I wanted to take a couple minutes to uh, first brief our students who are just coming in for the second round, uh, which is the second half of, uh, of our course, uh, what you need to do. Uh, but first, I, I wanted to make sure we are clear about what we're doing for the STEPS workshop. So the STEPS workshop will be um, on I think the 14th, if I'm not wrong. Let's just double check the calendar uh, of the month, next month. Uh, 14th of next month, which is the Wednesday. So Wednesday night, which is the night before the very last session that we have um, in, in our class here. Uh, let's see what I can put up. 14th, that's not the right month, here. Uh, we will have our steps workshop, 6 to 10 o'clock. Uh, hopefully it won't run that late. Uh, but what we need to do right now is put in our uh, abstracts and project titles. So make sure you go to the steps website. Okay, log in. So I'll go do that now. Okay, and then uh, you should be able to go to something like manage events and uh, uh, you should be able to see something a little bit like this where you can then um, click on your project and then uh, add, add information um, in Markdown for your project uh, description and then uh, whatever you type should come over on the other side as a uh, as a preview, right? So you know you, you should be able to figure out markdown. It's not too hard. Um, and then later on, you, you can add uh, media links if you'd like, and, and definitely your poster image uh, that you can compose. Later on, uh, we will have um, a template that you can use for the poster image. But you're you're free to use your own if you have a company's uh, template you'd like to use, for example. Okay. So uh, some people complained that they weren't able or they weren't sure how to go about doing that. So if uh, you try out these instructions, still doesn't work, uh, let me know, okay? So those are for all of you who are doing projects. Now, first year students uh, in their PhD program who are with us, can I have a show of hands who you are? Okay, so great. So all of you should get to know each other um, if you don't already. But uh, definitely, you are encouraged to do a project. You're not obligated to, but uh, definitely, uh, you are obligated to do a presentation and uh, do the questioner role. So uh, I think you, 
you will see it a couple times, but uh, you can look at the previous uh, sets of uh, slides that have been made by other people that are now on the website. So, um, for example, if you go to the course website, uh, you will see that already uh, we have uh, a number of recordings that are, are being done right now, uh, as well as the presenter slide. So that means those of you who are presenting will need to come up with a slide deck with the rest of the group that uh, you're working with, right? And then as questioners, uh, you guys are going to be responsible for two things. One is moderating the Slack channel. So I think there are a couple people in the room besides me who is on Slack right now, and the idea is to get uh, two separate feeds of information, one from the presenter, one from the questioners. And the questioners can also generate polls, put up uh, links on archive uh, when the presenters have mentioned. I think Tom Ahn uh, had, had done that while, while we were talking here. And the questioners also have to compile a summary. Okay, so that's a very key part is after the lecture is over, we compile a summary that can go on a Slack post, okay, in, in the channel. And then later what we'll do is we'll take all the posts or the summaries of the questioners that put up and we'll also add them to, to the artifacts from our course, okay? So again, the whole course design is, is done this way so that we're really giving back to the community, right? So not only do we record how confused we are, you know, and we, we make new slides or reuse slides that other people have done, uh, we try to contribute what are the questions and, and uh, papers and uh, preserve it for posterity, okay? So uh, if there are any questions about how, uh, for the first year PhD students, what you need to do for the second half, let me know. Otherwise, we'll finish here. I think uh, people for week 9 and 10 are trying to meet so that uh, we can get started getting preparations done for that. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah. That's the end of today. There are some um, some folks who are interested in the project uh, that Animesh and myself are, are doing uh, on scientific documents. If you want to work on that, just come down and see me after class. Okay, question. I just want to confirm that uh, in November, right, the workshop. 14th November. And we you don't need to demonstrate your project. Uh, what you will need to do, so it'll, it'll be at this time, which is, uh, I guess, uh, 6 to 10. So that's uh, steps. And, and, and it'll be at SR1, so it's in the lobby uh, nearby. Okay. You won't need to demo any software, but you're welcome to. So if you bring a laptop uh, and it's charged, then you can run your, your software. What you'll need to do is you need to create a project uh, poster, A1 size poster. And then uh, I think there are enough SOC students here that uh, even if you're not from SOC, you can have your print uh, poster printed by somebody in SOC. Okay, so you just give us the PowerPoint slide or better yet, the PDF of your slide, your A1 size poster and then we'll assign somebody to print out the poster, and then during the STEPS workshop itself, uh, it will be put up, okay? So you can see um, on the Slack channel, um, there were some pictures from last year uh, that were about that. Let me see whether I can scroll up far enough to see some of them. When do these posters need to be ready? Uh, when do they need to be ready? Let's see. So uh, I guess any time before week, uh, around uh, week 12 would be a good time to do it, okay? So it doesn't have to be too soon. You know, it can even be one or two days in advance of uh, actual steps, which is the 14th, okay? So normally everyone should have their poster ready by Monday. It gets printed Monday or Tuesday, and then Wednesday we present, okay? So uh, if you're not from SOC, please bring your compatriots from your units uh, to come down and, and view everyone else's projects. Uh, the machine learning uh, students in the undergraduate class, of which there are a couple here, uh, will also be presenting their projects. So some of them are also doing deep learning projects, so it'll be exciting for some of you to see what they are doing. Okay? All right, so uh, that's all for today. Thanks very much for coming. Sorry, it's so late.